Welcome, everyone. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Bozena Czerny, who give a talk today. So for many years, Bozena was working in the uh, Nikolaus Copernicus Astronomical Center of the Polish Academy of Sciences. But then she joined our institute in uh, 2015, I guess. And then, uh, well, she's a worldwide recognized astrophysicist working on, a, on the active galactic nuclei between. And last year, in the team uh, led by uh, Professor Grzegorz Pierszyński, uh, she won a very prestigious grant, ERC Synergy, which was just mentioned uh, a while ago. And today, she will give a talk about active galaxies as probes of the universe. So, Jenna, the screen is yours. I, I hope you, you see it. Uh, yes, yes, we see it. I did not plan to talk, uh, to uh, go into the details, but whenever you feel like asking a question, please do interrupt, because I think it's more important that, uh, to, to have a discussion than just for me to set the material which, which I uh, propose. So actually, my uh, talk will uh, start with short uh, uh, digression about post-empirism and especially post-experimental physics, because I was quite surprised by this uh, topic. And then I will tell shortly the history of AGNs and then how they are important for, for GR testing, and then finally for galaxy evolution, and then at the end uh, for using uh, those objects as galactic probes. Uh, so I'm not really politically or philosophically oriented, and those terms like post-empirism and post-experimental physics were kind of new to me, but one week ago, I attended a very nice lecture by Professor Stanisław Mrówczyński from National Center for Nuclear Research. And he considered in detail this issue, uh, saying that in the, uh, in the case of the largest distances like cosmology or or beyond or in the smallest scales, now physics propose uh, certain solutions uh, which are not easily testable. And then how we can judge what is attractive and what is not attractive. And in the case of cosmology, he, he gave uh, in particular this multiverse example when there are many universes and we live only with that one and how we can judge whether this is uh, still physics or uh, attractive physics or not physics or what. Uh, then I, I would like to, to, to share maybe an obvious uh, reflection uh, but indeed, we, we do not, in particularly in cosmology, when studying the distant uh, universe, mm, we do make some kind of assumptions, and I will be doing them later. So from the point of view of uh, special relativity, of course, if we sit in this two-dimensional space, which I, I draw here, and we are at present at some location, then uh, we use a light cone to, uh, to determine which region we know very well. And of course, this is this region below the, the light cone. But in astronomy, it's actually worse because we do not know the whole space below the light cone, because for that we would need signal which propagates much more slowly than the light. So instead, we are really doing observations only basically along the line, the light cone. 
And then if you think about the fact that, for example, AGNs are, or active galaxies are studied uh, since 100 years, then uh, you can think of the, of the studied part of the universe, like this line which I draw schematically from the present to the early universe, and this distance in light years is 13.7 uh, billion light years. While the width of this line, this what we really know is uh, more or less 100 years or actually less because it's, it, it, it depends on the, on the location. Cosmic microwave background was discovered 50 years ago, so then the width of the line is actually 50 years close to the early universe. So in the remaining part of my talk, I will assume just uh, standard uh, cosmological assumptions. First, cosmological principle that the observable uh, part of the universe is really representative for everything else. And universality of physics, that physics is the same everywhere. And if we actually remember that this uh, universe is expanding, we don't even see uh, always locations which are very much separated, but this light cone is in a sense curved and then we see really a small part of the universe during the or shortly after Big Bang. But I will not worry about that. I will, I will later assume that, well, we know what we know, what we can study along the light cone. And indeed, uh, AGNs are uh, studied, studies of AGNs uh, started already 100 years ago. Um, we can say that the first object discovered is BL LAC uh, object, BL LACERTE. This is uh, object located in, on the sky in LACERTE region. And it was uh, discovered uh, by Kuno Hofmeister, who noticed his uh, puzzling variability. Of course, then the source was identified as a star, variable star. And till, till now, this object is located at the web page of the observers of well, basically variable stars. This is this app. So uh, international uh, company. So only many years later, in 1969, this source was discovered with, uh, as a radio source, and then its, uh, its extragalactic nature was uh, established, although measurement of the redshift still took some, some time. And of course, in 60s, uh, already the quasars were born. But in a sense, quasars and stars were or are, still are mixed from the observational point of view. So active galaxies are nowadays also frequently observed by astronomer amateurs because they have now quite advanced uh, telescopes. So more serious uh, study of, of uh, active galaxies, uh, stage two, were performed in 1943 by Carl Seifert, who selected a few galaxies with exceptionally bright nuclei. He was puzzled by those sources, and those sources are still frequently monitored because they are nearby and convenient to observe. And then he did the spectroscopy. So he noticed immediately emission lines, which are broader, much broader than typical emission lines in, uh, from stellar populations. 
So he concluded already in this paper that uh, the emission from the nucleus does not come from stars, but it comes from a gas, which is uh, rotating very, very fast. He interpreted immediately this broadening as, a, as the result of the Doppler motion of the, of the uh, emitting material. Uh, of course, he, he knew he was observing a galaxy. You can see here two exposures. A uh, long exposure shows really the, 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 the arms of the, of the host galaxy. It's a spiral galaxy, while uh, a short exposure shows only the nucleus itself. Uh, then the next very important uh, branch of research was performed mostly after the Second World War, and that, that brought the discovery of the radio galaxies. This was uh, mostly due to the development of radar technology, um, and that uh, led later to uh, development of uh, radio astronomy. On the other hand, actually, the first two galaxies, radio galaxies, were already discovered in 1939 by Grote Rebe, who had his own small uh, dish telescope. But then, then he was the, the only radio astronomer in the world for some time. Later, after the war, as I mentioned, uh, the technology was developed uh, much further, and then this uh, antenna, which is on the on the uh, picture, was already used to uh, perform sec uh, third Cambridge uh, survey of radio. Uh, sources on the sky, and then many uh, objects were discovered. Some of those sources were easily identified uh, uh, with uh, galaxies, but some, and now we can even see the much more clearly the, the image of such uh, galaxy. On the other hand, some of those sources were point-like sources, like 3C273, the most famous uh, quasar. And identification of its nature was, was rather difficult because, you know, in then in the optical sky, there were many more objects. So the, the, the progress uh, came from two aspects. First, from the really precise measurement of the position of the radio source from moon occultation. And then with optical identification and spectrum was, was measured, spectrum looked like this. And it's really amazing how Martin Schmidt was really able to identify hydrogen lines there. Because you see, the comparison star shows uh, a lot of different lines. So it was not easy to guess that this, those hydrogen lines are the same as those hydrogen lines. But OK, he guessed. and he realized it's, it's just cosmological redshift and the source is uh, very different, very, very distant. So then those uh, four branches of, of uh, apparently separate studies like BLAC objects, uh, Cipher galaxies, radio galaxies, and quasars merged actually into active galactic nuclei. And they really form a single fa family, although some division is still used uh, just for, for convenience. So nowadays, we know more or less how this uh, structure of this active nucleus look like. Uh, this part of the, of the schematic pretty bad plot, shows the inner 100 parsecs. So it's really a small part of the whole galaxy. And 
most of the of the energy actually is dissipated here close to the central black hole the material flowing in forms an accretion disk then we can have uh, optionally a jet or a weaker jet or no jet that's that's under discussion actually then we have a lot of of, of clouds so our research really resembles the uh, study of uh, climate uh, problems sometimes or quite frequently it, this obscuring torus is uh, an obstacle but also a convenience because then we know basically it to more or less which range of angles we see the nucleus because if we see it side view then we don't see the true uh, innermost part, we don't see uh, emission lines, which are important. And the most compact uh, region here is the X-ray emitting region with the size of more or less 10 gravitational radii. So everything really happens very, very close to the black hole. So in modeling, uh, this accretion flow, as well as later the interaction between the galaxy and between the, the, the active nucleus and the host galaxy, we really use a lot of equations. I, I put here only names of those equations because otherwise I would spend a lot of time writing those equations down. And then we are not always using all those equations because Actually, ne we never use all those equations at the same time. We select what is needed for the project. But of course, we need uh, uh, Navier stock equations, uh, Stokes equations to, to describe dynamics. Then magnetic field is uh, important. So Mac Maxwell equations, GR effects are important. We need radiative transfer, that heating, cooling capacities, whatever, Compton scattering chemistry because molecules molecules populate this uh, region of the dusty molecular torus as the name implies and then particularly in the jet modeling you you can deal with per creation or other interactions like a neutrino emission proton collisions whatever a lot of physics but then you cannot do everything at the same time so you have to select what what you need, and then always confront with observations. So, of course, it's a great laboratory to study GR effects because, as I said, most of the energy is dissipated close to the black hole as 10 RG or something like that. On the other hand, it's buried in this physics, so it's not always simple. But okay, it's absolutely great that we can see M87, this, this famous image of the of the black hole. So black hole is this uh, black inner inner part here on this on this image, and then we see the hot inflowing or outflowing material. That's kind of a discussion because we must have an inflow, but we also must have a jet because we see this jet. So uh, active galactic nuclei are, are finally everywhere to some extent. It does not mean that every galaxy is a quasar, of course not, but every regular galaxy, and maybe regular as well, but that's more difficult to, to, to prove, every regular galaxy contains a supermassive black hole. Uh, for example, our Milky Way also contains this supermassive black hole, four times 10 to six uh, solar masses approximately. And now uh, Milky Way is, is really non, not, not active. Uh, although some traces of activity we see, and uh, I think uh, image of this black hole, which is known as Sagittarius A star, will be coming soon in, in, in half a year, we expect this, this image from the Event Horizon Telescope people. 
but this our galaxy also was was more active in the past as uh, you can see from the presence of uh, huge uh, gamma emitting and uh, fermi bubbles and x-ray emitting uh, erosita uh, bubbles but we studied also the traces of past activity with Michał Zajacek when he was still in, in, in Warsaw and by asking whether the presence of active jet could affect the stars in the uh, central part close to the nucleus. And our conclusion was that yes, because if such a red giant star with loose uh, envelope enters the jet, it is stripped of the envelope. And then it is visible not as this big red giant star. And that can explain why observationally we see less bright red giant stars in the galactic, in our galactic center than we would expect from the standard distribution of stellar masses. So why active galaxies are important? For many years, they were thought as just kind of curiosity or maybe for GR tests or something like that, but in general as of no importance for the galaxy evolution. And then two major statements were made, both in 1998. The first was by Magorian et al, who showed that the black hole mass scales with the mass of the of the bulge, which is the spherical most important part of the galaxy. So the black hole mass is really tiny. It's below 1% of the bulge mass. But the scaling implies that somehow black hole mass and the whole galaxy must co-evolve in order to keep this ratio constant. The details of this interaction are still under, under discussion, but the whole uh, phenomenon is known as a feedback mechanism. And we imagine that if we have too much inflow towards the black hole, then uh, there is a strong uh, jet, strong wind from the black hole that suppresses temporarily the formation of, of uh, stars in the, in the host uh, galaxy. So it's kind of self. Uh, regulating uh, mechanism. And anyway, the observations of uh, galaxy properties, how they change with the redshift imply that galaxies do not, or stars in the galaxies do not form as fast as they could. So this feedback additional is really needed to slow down the, the star formation rate. And then the second uh, paper came uh, from, uh, and argument came from Boyle and Terlevich when they noticed that if you study two effects as a function of radius, one is star formation rate, where you need a co-moving frame, and the other is the number of quasars, so strong active galactic nuclei, also per moving uh, unit volume, then those distributions traces each other. So that's another way to say that uh, quasars or, or active galaxies must co-evolve with, with uh, stars. Of course, the most uh, interesting question is, uh, uh, to ask how much one is delayed with the other, but this is not measurable. So the delay is quite uh, short. On the other hand, starlight must is star forming must have must happen a bit earlier than uh, quasar or consecutively uh, in some loops uh, because quasars have always a very high metallicity. Even at the highest redshift, you never see pure hydrogen quasars. There is nothing like that in the universe. 
So quasars are, are important for the evolution of the galaxies. But now with advanced understanding of quasars, not perfect, but you know, we can handle it more or less. We can also try to use them as a tools to cosmology. I think it's not much worse than in the case of supernovae 1a, because the exact mechanism of the supernovae 1a explosion is also under discussion. So it's fair to use or to try to use quasars. So one advantage, which is immediately obvious, is that AGN cover really a large range of uh, redshifts or distances, because the closest uh, um, AGNs are at very small distance. Then you measure it rather in megaparsecs, not in redshift, because it would be 0 0.0001 or something like that, or even one, one zero more. And then to up to the redshift uh, over 7, 7.64 is the current uh, record holder. We know over a million of AGN, so there are many of, of those. We don't know million of supernovae. And as I mentioned, they have always solar or slightly supersolar metallicity, so there is no evolution of their properties with redshift which might be a problem in the case of supernovae 1a sources. So AGNs are unresolved mostly, although marginally we can resolve them now uh, in the infrared, which is also quite, quite useful. Uh, fortunately, a their emission or the emission, emission which takes place close to the black hole is highly variable. So that allows a direct insight into uh, their structure. And then emission extends from radio through infrared, optical UV to X-rays and eventually gamma rays. So we see a lot of uh, signals, independent ob observations from their spectra, and then in particular their variability. So because AGNs are numerals and they have uh, interesting uh, properties, there are many uh, ways how we can use them in cosmology. So here I, I made a complete list or almost complete list uh, of methods, how we can use uh, quasars. But if I start to talk about these individual methods, of course, I will not finish in half an hour, or actually that would be a, a long series of lectures, I suppose. So here, I will concentrate later on on emission line time delays, which we are doing, although we are doing also this extreme quasar case and continue, and now we started continuum time delay case. But I will concentrate on this blue aspect. So how did the, the optical UV spectrum of the quasar looks like. So first of all, you see a lot of continuum emission. This is the, the, the body of this distribution. And that continuum emission comes from an accretion disk. This continuum emission here bends, but this is the, the contribution from the stars, from the starlight. So it, in very bright quasars, it's not so important, but it may, may happen. And then on the top of it, you see strong emission lines. And for cosmology, we are using magnesium 2 and H beta line. Uh, but we will be so using carbon 4. 
measurements as well. Not our measurements, but uh, other measurements. How we can do that? Well, we will use this variability which I mentioned. So the situation is like that. We, uh, the emission which happened, the continuum emission which happens close to the black hole is strongly variable and it irradiates this clumpy distribution of, of clouds, which is known as, as broad line region. And then, of course, the clouds respond to the ir changing irradiation with some kind of time delay. So then, uh, in observations, we can measure the time delay of the line with respect to the underlying uh, continuum. Uh, we are using measurements done by other people, but in the case of magnesium two line, we also have our own measurements which are done using uh, salt uh, telescope, 11 meter telescope in, in, in South Africa. And we can do later the whole procedure using two approaches. Either we can use this theoretical approach, saying that we know where, what is this distance in absolute units for a given uh, object of a black hole mass and accretion rate from the theory, or parametric approach. So theoretical approach, uh, should be based on, on our theory, because I, I still think it's an attractive uh, idea, which we developed with, with Krzysztof Reniewicz some time ago, uh, namely the temperature in the equation disk is lower when we go farther and farther away from the uh, black hole. And then at some point we reach the effective temperature, which is equal to the dust sublimation temperature. And then the radiation pressure coming from the disk acts in much stronger way. I think I was talking about it uh, more uh, a year ago. And then those clouds are jumping. So then this transition would be really set by the value of the uh, dust sublimation temperature, which is known with uh, now reasonable accuracy partially from uh, direct observations. And it's, it looks like it's be between 15 and 1700 uh, Kelvin. So if we, if we know the, the, the theory, then we know the coefficients in so-called radius-luminosity relation. That means that if we measure this size of the broad line region as the time delay, then we measure the absolute luminosity of the source. And if we measure the absolute luminosity of the source, then we can determine the distance because it's very easy to measure the observed luminosity. And then the luminosity distance is just defined as intrinsic luminosity divided by four pi uh, observed luminosity. And then we take a square root and we have the luminosity distance. And of course, to construct a Hubble diagram, we need redshift, but if we have emission lines, we can measure redshift very easily. On the other hand, as I mentioned uh, one year ago, uh, computed the, the region is extended. So those coefficients from the model are not yet well determined. So for the moment, we can restore to more general approach with coefficients which are just certain alpha and certain beta, and then we can fit those coefficients also to the to the data. Oops, sorry. So for the moment, we are using this second approach, which does not allow to get the Hubble constant, but it's a kind of safer and more conservative. But we are waiting for the uh, determination of exact coefficients from the, from the model. 
So if we use just a general approach, then we can form, we can test this radius luminosity relation for a known cosmology. This is based on magnesium to line delays and those quasars, brightest quasars are our quasars. If we constrain our sample only to brightest sources, then the dispersion is somewhat uh, lower. So it looks reasonable, so we can try to use this, inverting the problem as it was here and trying to do the cosmology with that. Oh, sorry. And we did in the, in the paper, which was published in uh, uh, this year. So we constructed the Hubble diagram, the luminosity distance as a function of redshift with our quasars. And then, as I said, we cannot uh, calculate the Hubble constant in that case, but only those two other uh, parameters of the standard cosmological model, omega matter and omega lambda. And this is our best solution from radius luminosity relation. Those are uh, values uh, favored by, by Planck. And those two agree within the two sigma error. So there is no problem with the cosmology, with the standard cosmological model in our data. On the other hand, errors are quite, quite large. Uh, recently, we used uh, slightly increased uh, sample of, of objects. So now we have 78. Uh, a time delay measurement, but still in magnesium too. And we have a big uh, table with uh, also other models, not just testing flat uh, uh, lambda CDM model or, or general lambda CDM model, but also uh, testing other more advanced cosmological uh, models, and then we also try to combine this, uh, uh, our observations with uh, baryon acoustic oscillations and uh, with uh, chronometric uh, measurements of the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, in that case, we can uh, get the Hubble constant, which is uh, quite consistent with, with uh, Hubble, uh, with, with uh, Planck measurements. And in all those new studies, we also do not see any, any tension with, with lambda CDM model in the current data. So overall, indeed, this standard cosmological model is, is quite successful. So why to, 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 to bother to check it again with a different uh, probe. Here you have results from, from Planck. I guess we can have a newer picture, but I didn't download it. Anyway, you have 70% of, of the energy in the form of dark energy, and then 25% in the form of dark matter which is a bit frustrating because we don't understand any of those two components. Then you have 5% in the form of baryonic matter. And out of those 5%, actually, you see 10%. So 0.5% you see directly in the form of stars or gas or hot gas. A bit frustrating, but all works well. And the basic uh, parameters of the cosmological model is, is Hubble constants, omega matter, and omega lambda. And this is what, what, we, what we measured uh, also in our previous approach. And of course, in principle, since the model is global, then you can measure all those three quantities. Mm, uh, 
in every time moment of the universe and when reducing this to the current value, you should get the same. So either measuring of the microwave background or measuring uh, relatively nearby quasars, you should always uh, get the same result if a, a standard cosmological model applies. And that is a problem because uh, there are some arguments for the so-called uh, tension. It's a very fancy word. And this tension is mostly visible in the, in the measurement of the present value of the Hubble constant, because the early universe measurements, for example, from, from mostly from Planck, they imply values something like 67 kilometers per second, per megaparsec, you see with small error. And then late measurements, which means quasar, supernovae, kind of stuff which fills the, 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 the space to, till the redshift two or, or so, this is still late universe. That implies that the measurement more like 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This tension- Ojana, can, I, can I stop you here for a second? Yes, sure. Because you use these two, uh, two terms in passing, but maybe it uh, uh, would be nice to, to explain this to, to the audience that are not cosmologists, because these are not the measurements of the expansion rate at early and late universe. These are no. current, this, this are, this are measurement of the current expansion rate, but uh, the one from CMB is basically uh, uh, evolved yeah. lin by using linear perturbation theory down to, we're using basic background model down to redshift zero, because some of the model, some of the people think that this is expansion rate from the early universe and late universe. This is still no, present this day is, expansion rate, yes. This is what I said when showing this, this slide, right? I said it's a global model. So for global model, wherever you measure, whatever you measure, and when you translate your measurement to the current value of the expansion rate, current value of the omega matter, and current value of the omega lambda, you should get the same thing, right? This is what I said. Because of course, the, 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 the value of the, of the Hubble constant depends on the, on the redshift. Omega matter depends on the redshift, omega lambda depends on the redshift. But when we quote the measurements, indeed, we uh, show the current values. And this is why it's uh, notified as H naught and not just H. Yeah, but also cosmological model is not entering that much uh, the, the local universe measurement. Which is the the own, but it's actually absolutely yes. necessary to assume for the. Yes, I will. I will. I will shortly talk about. Okay, that. I'm not interrupting anymore. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. So here at the phase value, we see that there is a strong disagreement, and particularly this measurement, which is the second from the top. This is argued by Adam Rees, the the Nobel. Uh, prize winner, and he claims that he's absolutely, absolutely sure that we have 4.5 uh, tension. Here you see many other measurements. They are mostly consistent with uh, his measurements. I do not have here, uh, I think, the measurements of the Wendy Friedman, if I see correctly. Letters are small, it's not my, my plot, but she mm, calibrated Supernovae 1A with the tip of the red giant branch, and she's getting measurements which are more consistent actually with, with Planck. Uh, some other aspects of, of tension are reported in the very shape of the Hubble diagram, and this is done in the paper of uh, Lusso and uh, Rizaliti and uh, collaborators, where they are unhappy with the shape of the, of the uh, Hubble diagram. They do some kind of an expansion of the general cosmological model. It's like Taylor expansion, more or less. And they see some kind of disagreement in the, in the expected uh, curvature. And then uh, studying uh, also the observational data, 
uh, Marek Demiański is arguing quite strongly that standard cosmological model cannot apply. He is using this uh, uh, also now pretty standard uh, parametrization um, of the dark energy in the form of the uh, coefficient which stands in front between the pressure and the density. Uh, uh, C light speed is equal one here in this expression. And then this coefficient uh, can, in principle, evolve with uh, redshift. And this form of the evolution is uh, uh, bridging the values between omega zero now and omega one at infinity, right? And cosmological constant would correspond to uh, omega zero equal minus uh, one and om omega one equal zero. So here, omega one equals zero is clearly separated at, I don't know, 10 sigma or whatever, quite, quite large. He used a number of combinations of supernovae, gamma ray bears, and more. And then there is one more tension, which is in a very mysterious parameter. Later, Wojtek can explain that to you, but it's something like sigma eight. For the moment, let's not talk about this, this uh, nature of this parameter, but again, this parameter is measured independently with, with uh, Planck, and then it does not overlap with the uh, astronomical measurements uh, up to the redshift one or two, something like that. And this is what I wanted now to, to, to stress that uh, what I said before, that the cosmological, standard cosmological model is simple and it contains only Hubble constants uh, um, and two parameters, omega matter, omega lambda, current values, then it's not quite true. I took this from the uh, oldish uh, web page, so those values which are given here are not quite correct, but you see there are a number of quite mysterious parameters like uh, density perturbation spectral index, density perturbation amplitude, ionization optical depth, that means that recombination does not uh, occur immediately when this cosmic microwave background uh, forms. Then you have bias parameters. And then in addition, the sigma eight is not one of those parameters directly measured, but it's kind of a secondary parameter derived from those parameters. So everything is much more complicated that you can think even in, in, in measurements uh, done with the use of cosmic microwave back. So that's, that's my understanding of the situation, that reported change, tensions may be real, but they may be also due to underestimated systematic measurements, because it's easy to, to estimate uh, statistical errors, but not so much systematical errors. And then the safest way uh, out is to have numerous pro probes but not just to combine them, but ra rather cross calibrate those. And then AGN also can be such probes. And there are uh, ongoing massive uh, surveys uh, like SDSS reverberation mapping, OSDS, they are also reporting new time delays so we can improve uh, soon the results we are uh, getting. Uh, Mm, using the same methodology as I, I mentioned uh, before. Then uh, we got this new ERC synergy grant, which will be used to build a dedicated 2.5 meter telescope. And then we will more carefully study individual sources. And then we will study whole uh, cosmic ladders from uh, starting from better calibration of binary stars through better calibration of supernovae using Gaia for calibration, etc., and then going finally to, to AGNs. 
But this is uh, just the future formally the grant started two days ago, so we still didn't do much. Right? The telescope will be located in Cerro Amazonas Observatory. So this is the place where this EELT telescope will be located. So EELT will be on the, on the main mountain, and we are on the second mountain, but not, not too far from their uh, location. And there are already a few telescopes there, which we were actually using for to get photometry for our uh, quasars uh, monitored with, with salt. And then soon we will have the Rarubin Observatory, which will produce a legacy survey of space and time. Before that was known as LSST. And that will bring 10 lights, 10, 10 uh, Light, uh, light uh, of uh, continuous uh, monitoring. And we can use this continuous monitoring either in the form of uh, line delay, a continuum time delays, or continuum continuum time delays. And we can do it for thousands of uh, objects. Uh, we hoped for more, but probably, uh, well, we will have to try because this this uh, LSST uh, will contain a million of, of uh, AGNs, but the quality of the data will not always allow to use it for cosmology. And thank you. Okay, thank you.